So, Dad, mm -hmm. I'm starting a podcast with a friend of mine. What's that? Uh, it's basically like a radio show, but it's on okay. the internet. Okay. Make sure that uh, that program doesn't contain controversial subjects and uh, you're not impolite to people. Oh, definitely not, Dad. You know me. I'm never, <laughs> ever controversial. Or yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, you don't really believe me, do you? Oh, yeah. You don't. <laughs> Welcome to Polite Conversations with Ina and Paul. We promise this to be a place where there will be nothing controversial ever discussed by anyone about anything. Sex? Nope. Politics? Definitely not. Religion? Are you kidding me? You get a female ex-Muslim together who happens to be a minority with a white ex-military ex-Christian American male and watch the magic happen. Polite Conversation with Ina and Paul. Welcome to the conversation. Welcome to the very first episode of Polite Conversations with Ina and Paul. Nothing offensive shall ever be discussed here. Certainly not sex, politics, or religion. So it's me, Ina, your ex-Muslim host from the Nice Mangoes blog, and Paul. Hello, Paul Sading, the Q podcast and creator of Atheist Apocalypse podcast. The rare creature that he is, white <laughs> heterosexual male. There aren't enough of us around, Ina. And we are incredibly fortunate to be starting off with such a fantastic guest today. Let me take a moment to introduce the wonderful, inspirational, ex-Muslim activist, Mariam Namazi. Welcome to the conversation. Hi, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Yeah, for thank joining you for us. joining us, Mariam. So you've been really busy lately, and um, we have quite a few things to ask you questions about. Firstly, you guys started... Um, an amazing campaign called the uh, Ex-Muslim Because. Can you just tell me a bit more about that and how it came to be and how popular it got, how quickly? Yeah, I mean, uh, Ex-Muslim Because is actually the idea of one of our activists, Rehane Sultan. She's a um, Bangladeshi secularist and ex-Muslim. She was talking about how it would be great to have this hashtag so that people can see that we're not ex-Muslims because we want to be anti-Muslim, but because we have reasons for wanting to think for ourselves and that we have a right to leave religion and to criticize it. And so at a volunteer meeting, we thought, well, we decided what the best hashtag would be. And we basically didn't really think that it would take off in this way. We, we, we thought we'd announce it a few weeks earlier and hope that by December 10th, which is International Human Rights Day, we would have enough, um, you know, ha uh, hashtags and people joining in so that we could showcase them and say, look, you know, there, there are so many people out there. Of course, it took off like crazy in, in 24 hours. It had already trended. Uh, and I think the last time we looked, 120,000 people had joined in the conversation wow. from 65 different countries. So it was amazing. That's that's really and and for me, I mean personally, it was so touching because as an ex-Muslim myself, I felt really alone for a lot of the time. Like when I didn't know other ex-Muslims existed, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, and I mean I stopped identifying as a Muslim even as a teenager. So just to see this come together and see so many people in the videos and photos, it was really emotional and. I mean, those videos, they kind of made me teary-eyed. Yeah, I think that's the case for a lot of us. It's, it's funny how um, it did make a lot of us feel teary-eyed. It was so heartbreaking at times, inspirational at others, funny. You know, it was just really, it, it, it was, it, it sort of felt like our coming out party, like exactly. a, mass, a mass party, you know. So, I mean, it was like a bunch of people coming together saying that we don't have to be ashamed of, uh, you know, who we are, and we have a right to leave, and that doesn't make us bigots. Many of us chimed in to tell the bigots who were kind of hijacking our tweets to stop, I think. But on the other hand, a lot of Muslims got offended just by the existence of the hashtag, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there were Muslims who did support us and tried to join in and and uh, say that we have a right to leave. And of course, there yeah. were others who were offended. There were a lot of uh, so-called left liberal progressives who were also offended, uh, right. you know, on behalf of the so-called Muslim community. So that was very interesting. You know, the BBC uh, trending and right. World Service did a program on it, which I, I just it just really made me so frustrated to see how they had turned something that was so wonderful into something that was basically, you know, not the right time, you know, feeding into bigotry, xenophobia and all of that, when actually it was just defending such a fundamental human right. Right, and one that they would support Christians for in a second. Well, and Miriam, for anybody who's not familiar with what happened and how it was portrayed, can you kind of give them an idea of how they presented it? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because um, I went to their studios and we had a half an hour interview about the issues. And, um, well, you know, when they did broadcast it on BBC World Service, they had two uh, Muslim men basically speaking about how it was not the right time, right after Paris, that it was feeding into bigotry against Muslims and also that, um, you know, um, it was something that um, was not a helpful thing to do. And, you know, it, it's very interesting given the fact that, you know, one of the things I did say was that, yes, it's after Paris, but, you know, Paris is not the only marker for, for, for many of us. There are uh, people getting killed by Islamism every day. Every day is a Paris in, in reality for many Absolutely. people in the Middle East and North Africa, you know, and, it, how can it never be the right time for something that is so fundamental and necessary? You know, it should never, you know, it should always be the right time to talk about basic rights and the right Absolutely. to think freely. Right. And, yeah, uh, so, sorry, continue. Yeah, no, so I found, I just found it really frustrating. I, I've had this experience with the BBC a few times before. One was on you know, when they had asked me to come and speak about the stoning, impending stoning of a woman in Iran, and I was waiting to come online, and they basically interviewed two people who defended stoning, one from a Sharia court here in Britain and one from Tehran, and they didn't let me come on, and they told me they didn't have time for, for, for my contribution. And honestly, after that, I just burst out crying, you know, because I felt so frustrated that here's mm. a woman facing death by stoning. They've had two people defend her stoning um, sentence and they haven't put me on. And, you know, I felt the same way after the, listening to the BBC trending program. I just, you know, I just thought, gosh, how can they turn something that is so wonderful into something so ugly? Right. Well, worst of all is that they used <laughs> pre-recorded clips of yours and they let other people respond to you. Like, in real time, which I think is a very unfair way of doing it, where you cannot respond back. You're just a recorded clip, and they can say whatever they want in response to what you said, but you can't right. defend yourself. Yeah, and, and the, the thing is, if you look at BBC trending videos, they're not usually like that. You know, they're pieces about something, and they oftentimes stand on their own. They, they're standalone pieces. Um, you know, it's interesting, whenever it comes to us, suddenly there needs to be balance and impartiality, according to them. And usually it always ends up not in our favor, the, the sort of balance position, so-called, that they, they try to hold. What is right. that that creates that kind of um, atmosphere, Miriam? I mean, and I know I'm putting you on the spot with that, but I'm just curious because, you know, living in America, we're not familiar with the lay of the land over there when it comes to these types of issues. What are the influencers? What are the drivers for the way that they, I don't know, with kid gloves, they, they take this kid glove approach uh, to addressing these topics? No, I think it's, it's an issue uh, across the board here in Europe. I, I would think it's also something that uh, I, I know is, you know, something that happens in Canada. I think it does happen yeah. to uh, an extent in, in the U.S. as well, in North America. I mean, the idea behind it is basically, you know, that um, Muslims are seen to be a homogeneous community. Uh, therefore, uh, because they're seen to be a minority community that's, that faces racism, any criticism of Islamism, which is actually the fascists, uh, you know, the fascists and the, the right wing. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 if, if you criticize the fascists 
or within Muslims like the Islamists or if you criticize Islam, it seemed to be the same as attacking a minority group. And obviously that's not the case. And so, you know, I, I suppose any sort of criticism, you know, with us saying we're ex-Muslims because we choose to think freely or for whatever reason, is seen to be bigotry against Muslims. And of, of course that's not the case. One, not all Muslims think as Islamists do. If they did, there would not be a single person alive in, on this planet. Absolutely. And second of all, um, you know, there are many Muslims that are supporting us, even if they don't like apostates, they, you know, they don't advocate their murder and they don't go out and threaten people. So I, I sometimes very often feel offended on behalf of Muslims, even though I'm not even a Muslim <laughs> myself. But, you know, I'm offended on behalf of my parents and my family. And I think, my gosh, they're the loveliest people on earth. And, you know, immediately they're equated with a, a movement that many of them have fled. That's why they live, you know, in, across the world in many places. Um, and it's also a movement that they've they've resisted in various ways, and now they're very because of in a sense multicultural policies. They're sort of seen to be one and the same with those who have oppressed them. Right. It's so it's so patronizing to just assume that all Muslims just can't handle criticism, because many of them can, and many of them fight the same things that you know we as critics are fighting for just maybe to a lesser degree or whatever wherever they draw their line but that yeah. uh, diversity doesn't get recognized by this left which is kind of racist in itself i think you know bigoted or racist where they yeah definitely uh yeah and it happens in canada it happens in the states i mean just look at um john stewart i don't know if if you're familiar on that side of the world with the daily show but uh he's like a comedian he had a late night talk show host and he loves to mock uh religion the far right christians and but when it comes to islam he completely you know he welcomes reza aslan with the warmth of a thousand suns or whatever like when reza aslan's spouting complete nonsense but when you know a critic of islam goes on he's immediately guarded so that double standard exists and with me as well in canada uh, the the CBC has contacted me a few times and then mysteriously not had time to have me on their show or, you know, had the schedule bumped or something like that. Because when they hear that I'm an ex-Muslim, they hear my views, when they vet me, they're just not, they're not comfortable because I'm supposedly some sort of bigot, even though I fight against anti-Muslim, fight, you know, against people who are anti-Muslim bigots all the time, but they put me in the same camp as them. So it's very frustrating. I can understand how you must feel when the BBC does that to you. Yeah, and I think it is something that's across the board. It's it's the, the media. It's also many organizations, uh, of course, universities. Uh, I had a problem, for example, in Canada, I think, I don't know, 15 years ago, a really long time ago, where I was a member of the Canadian Council for Refugees. Um, and uh, because I, mm -hmm. I've done refugee rights work for, I don't know, 15 years uh, previously and um, you know uh, we basically were like a coalition of groups defending refugee rights mm -hmm. and I po posted an article I'd written about the reasons why refugees flee from Iran and I talked about Sharia law and gender apartheid and this and that and I was kicked out of the Canadian Council of Refugees for being a bigot because mm -hmm. I was talking about Sharia laws and its effects on people right. and the reasons why people are <laughs> fleeing. You know, so I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, I mean, really, as you said, the bigotry is coming from them when they mm -hmm. don't allow, permit any dissent. And they feel quite free to have that right for themselves, but not for, for us. Yeah. And what, Miriam, one of the interesting things for me when I did uh, when I did chronify me for those two years and I started doing the ex-Muslim interviews was I found through listener feedback uh, that the progressive you just your common person on the progressive side of the of life they really looked favorably on those interviews they love they consumed them those were always the highlights of that show is when i could get an ex-muslim to come on and talk about their experiences but associated with the progressive movement it is it, it's like compartment compartmentalized there's a a more extreme aspect to the progressive side 
So who I have found, and it may just be the way I see it, they tend to kind of look at the ex-Muslim experience and, and the perspective with a different pers- with a different perspective of their own, they kind of almost look at it unfavorably. Um, is has that been your experience? Is, is that how you have seen it as well? And do you have any insight for us as to why that is? Why people who associate with the more progressive values will, in the same breath, turn around and discount and disregard the ex-Muslim experience? Yeah, I mean, I think it's because um, you know. Y- Basically, it seemed to be a sort of you're, you're causing trouble, aren't you? And if uh, you you look at the Muslim community as a homogeneous community, then anyone who's saying, "Well, I'm an ex-Muslim, I've left it," seems to be sort of causing trouble for a community supposedly that already has enough trouble, in a sense. And I think it all goes back to boils down to identity politics, you know. Uh, it's no longer, you know, um, fashionable to defend ideals and join political and social movements based on ideals. It's all now just, you know, a boil down to identity. So if you want to be progressive, you show your loyalty and allegiance and support to an identity, the Muslim identity, and therefore anyone that sort of criticizes it or uh, criticizes um, you know, anything associated with it, and we're not even talking about criticism of people, but of ideas or of religious right-wing movements, you're, you're completely seen to be as, um, you know, causing trouble, causing, um, you know, more discrimination, inciting hatred. I mean, these are all the sorts of things I've been accused of. Mm-hmm. And I think it boils down to the fact that when you do subscribe to identity politics, you see a community as homogeneous, um, those in power are the ones who therefore determine what the culture of that homogeneous mass is supposed to be. In, in, in this instance, it'll be the Islamists, the people who have state power or have influence in political movements. And so, in a sense, it, it's, you know, allegiance to the Muslim community very often ends up meaning allegiance to Islamists. And we see that very clearly. You know, you've got Stop the War Coalition um, defending you know, the Islamic regime of Iran, for example, mm-hmm. um, George Galloway, a lot of the so-called left progressives mm-hmm. are siding with the Islamists against us. And it's basically seeing all of us through the eyes of the Islamists. Mm-hmm. And it's so short-sighted, too, because if they intend to sort of uh, stand up for the underdog, they completely skip out on the minorities within the minorities. And how is it that they just cannot see that? It's bizarre yeah you're right and and i think part of it is they can't see it because they the community is a homogeneous mass according to them so there are no free thinkers there are no dissenters there are no ex-muslims and if you say you're an ex-muslim you're a native informant or you're you know an uncle tom or <laughs> what, the colonizers yeah whatever <laughs> they call us you know every day so um and it's so it's it's basically um well, i think you know, multiculturalism as a social policy and identity politics has warped the brains of, seriously warped the brains of uh, generations of those who are on the left and who are seen to be progressive. And so they actually cannot see dissent and um, because they see everything through the Islamist narrative. And that's why I think it's so important for us to show that dissent dissent exists. We're actually doing a big service, not just to ex-Muslims, but for many Muslims who are also stifled by this homogenized view of the Muslim community. You know, so I think actually what we're doing, we are often seen as troublemakers. We are seen as people who just provoke and go a bit too far. But I think, in a sense, we are going a bit too far for all of us, you but know, that's and how, not just for ex-Muslims. That's how progress has always happened, right? Like, interracial marriage didn't just become acceptable because people decided to be polite about it. People decided to challenge these bad ideas and say, no, well, human rights are human rights, and people are, deserve equality. And that's basically, you know, what we're saying is we will challenge bad ideas. And it's so important to do that. It's important to go far. It's important to provoke in some situations. It's important to be blasphemous. 
and draw cartoons that are blasphemous because without that, we'll never move ahead. Well, one of the things that I liked about what your work, what your work, Miriam, with that hashtag campaign is because it, you know, we, we, you can fight these battles at policy level all day long, but you have to win it at the grassroots level. And I think that's what you all, you know, Paul's perspective, that's what you all accomplished with that hashtag. As someone who is never a Muslim, I found myself invested in that in following that hashtag because of those, you know, the, the personal anecdotes that, mm-hmm. you know, that impact of a single human being, a single voice multiplied thousands of times over. That was very powerful. And I think that was a big win for you all. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. It, it is important to uh, provoke and to challenge. I, I do agree that, you know, blasphemy and apostasy, when it's banned and illegal, it should be celebrated and it should mm-hmm. be done every day as a way of normalizing it and pushing the boundaries as, as far as possible. I think if we look at um, this hashtag, and even before that, you know, a few years ago when the Council of Ex-Muslims was established, you know, since then, it's not actually a very long time. I think it's eight years now that we've been formed. We have now so many ex-Muslim organizations, local mm-hmm. groups, um, you know, and uh, people speaking up as ex-Muslims in a way that would, would have seemed impossible only seven, eight years ago. And so I think all of, you know, this sort of provocation, I know oftentimes we're criticized for it. You know, just leave it be. You've left. Don't make a big fuss about it. And you won't need to be threatened. That's mm-hmm. what the Islamists will often tell us. Yeah. But also there are some in the ex-Muslim uh, so-called community. And I say community because, again, we're not all the same as well. We have people who are bigoted and on the far right, as okay. well as people who are on the left and in the center. And just like any other group of people you know so um uh, but but i think actually that, that this it, uh, what's in time it's proving that it is right to do this and as you said um before as well i know is that this is the way you change things you push boundaries it's uncomfortable of course very often it seemed to be going overboard, you know, being too provocative. But eventually, uh, we're seeing that, yeah, it, it does make a huge difference. And it makes a huge difference very, very quickly yeah. compared to trying to do it quietly behind the scenes. That I don't think that ever really works. Right. And speaking of making a difference, uh, I think you made a huge one uh, with your recent talk at Goldsmiths University, where the Islamic Society uh, decided to um, try to stop you from being allowed to speak and they released a statement and weirdly the feminist society released a statement in support of the islamic society the lgbt society you were still uh, brave you went on and you were still um, heckled harassed they were sitting in the front row these people from the islamic society they were uh, one even pulled the plug for the projector, I believe. Uh, can you describe how it was just to talk in the face of all of that? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, if you see the video, it's, it is it is quite an intimidating climate. Um, yeah. And, you know, they, they shut the light off. They First of all, they waited till my talk started, and then they came in, banging the door, throwing themselves mm-hmm. on the floor. You can't see that bit because it's on me, the camera, until it zooms out a bit so that you can see par- parts of the audience. Um, and they kept shouting safe space and, you know, um, uh, trying to, um, I know it was, it was hilarious. Honestly, I felt like I was in the twilight zone, you know? Right. Cause if um, anyone needs a safe space, it's you <laughs> exactly, who's being attacked. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I, it just, um, you know, I, I knew that there might be trouble because I, I heard that, you know, that they had written to the atheist society the night before asking them to politely politely asking them to cancel my talk and so I knew possibly that they might come to make trouble but sometimes they don't because what they do is they try to put pressure on the group in order to get them to cancel the event before I show up and Mm -hmm. so I will show up and at times they won't come uh, because they've done their behind the scenes intimidation Mm -hmm. other times they'll come and try to cause some problems and this was you know um uh, one of those instances. I mean, what what I uh, what I've been told by other people, and when I watched the video back myself, I, I looked really calm. You, and, were, uh, you were awesome. I, 
honestly, I, I, I was after watching it because I, of, of course, I didn't feel that way. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're thinking a million things while you're trying to talk, I didn't feel as calm as I looked in the video. And for me, really, I just had two aims. One is to make sure they don't cancel it because I thought if they cancel it, it's just going to be, you know, something a precedent for them to be able to just carry on doing that and intimidate other people uh, Mm -hmm. where they can. And also to try and make sure that it doesn't end into violence because, of course, you also don't want people to feel unsafe coming to talks about apostasy and blasphemy and, you know, a free expression. So, uh, you know, trying, those those two were at the top of my mind. And um, and honestly, I, I wasn't sure anyone in the audience agreed with me uh, just because they had created such a climate where people, you can really tell from their expressions how they were feeling. And then slowly as the meeting progressed, people spoke up. And at the end, uh, before the end, I got quite a large applause. And I was actually taken quite back because <laughs> I didn't realize so many people actually agreed with me. You know, and I've got letters after that saying that, you know, people felt so um, uh, afraid and intimidated and that they they agreed with me, but they were too scared to say anything. Mm-hmm. And I, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. And I think what I love about what happened is that, you know, everybody's saying that they tried, but they failed. And that's, you know, for me, that's a big win. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a big win. And I think uh, it makes a big difference that they failed to do that and I think they've uh, somewhat been shamed too because one of the guys I think he was exposed for having uh, said some really awful homophobic things on his Twitter account and then he shut down his Twitter account and resigned from the Islamic society because you know the LGBT society came out in support of them so that just doesn't add up right yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I also think, though, that, you know, why did, if they hadn't found homophobic tweets from the president of the Islamic society, uh, it would it would be fine. All what they've done would seemingly be fine, according to the student union there. They didn't write to me about what happened. They only wrote to me six times asking me to remove the video, mm-hmm. which I refused to do because mm-hmm. I said that's, you know, in the public interest. And mm-hmm. it's the only evidence that's available because right after the meeting, they actually said that the Atheist Society threatened and intimidated them. Oh. And it's um, not you like know, the cameras were hidden. I mean, they were in plain sight. They knew they were being recorded. Yeah. No, of right. course, and they also recorded sections of it and posted it even before we posted the video. So oh. obviously they had no problem with videotaping. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they did it with their private phones, whereas ours was a visible camera, you know. Mm-hmm. So they mm-hmm. wanted to basically um, take only sections of me, you know, shouting at the guy to tell him to leave um, and uh, made it seem, it wanted to make it seem like we were the ones who attacked them, basically. Mm-hmm. So... Well, when the video came out, I think it's very clear for everyone except for the student union there, which has issued a statement saying that they've concluded their investigation and that both societies may face disciplinary action and they're going to give them training on external student policies and safe, safe space policies. So, And that's basically, so ridiculous <laughs> I mean, to treat them both the same when one is clearly the aggressor here. I don't understand yeah. why they can't, you know acknowledge that out of out of morbid curiosity mariam what was the rationale and justification for requesting that you not post or take down the video they said it's because of the privacy of the students um you know so uh the uh, what i said is that it, it was a public meeting it was implied consent given the fact that there is a video uh you know is in plain sight and everybody saw that it was being recorded and what's interesting, I mean, they, they also complained to YouTube at least 20 times because that's it was posted on our Bread and Roses TV program channel. Mm-hmm. And YouTube informed us that that was the case um, and that they were investigating. But they also said that if no one's been named uh, and no one's, um, you know, personal details are on, that it doesn't violate privacy things. So YouTube didn't pull the plug either. That's good. Um, you know, so... Uh, I think the what, what I, the point I want to make is that they've completely missed the whole point. As has this whole, you know, this whole um, scandal over the president's homophobic tweets. Had he not had those tweets not be found, it would have just been business as usual for them, mm-hmm. and it's still right. going to be business as usual for them because they'll just find another homophobic president. Yeah. What? 
they're missing is that actually the Islamic society, one of its aims is homophobia and misogyny because it's not a regular, ordinary Muslim student organization. It is very much an Islamist organization. That's my opinion on, on this. And I think uh, what they're missing is the fact that they've had speakers like Hamza Sortzes, who is, you know, who has spoken out against homosexuality, who has said that beheading of apostates is a painless way to be killed. Right. Um, and, you know, obviously he's speaking from his and perspective. And he was on uh, Ashley Madison, too, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I was telling them uh, that it's actually, yeah, it is very painless for the executioner. And because he's <laughs> speaking on behalf of the executioners. That's why he thinks it's a very painless way to be. It's killed. ridiculous. I mean, what what kind of justification is that? That like I don't I don't even know what to say. <laughs> How can you I just know, it's, it's, people? But but uh, what what I want to say is that this organization is doing all that. They found some tweets from him. He's the fall guy basically, and they're just going to carry on uh, as usual. And obviously, the student union has decided they're not really going to take anything seriously enough. Right. right. Um, you know, so uh, in a sense, I, I think also the real story here is their apostate, apostate phobia, you know, uh, and this is a real phobia because it's about people, not about a religion mm -hmm. or belief, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it has nothing to do with bigotry against people like homophobia or xenophobia. Now, what, you know, Gita Sahgal, who's the head of the Center for Secular Space, she was actually the person who was, fired from Amnesty International for criticizing their relationship with cage prisoners. Right, I remember. Uh, because they're like defending defensive jihad and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. They support the Taliban. Now, um, actually one of the speakers <laughs> at this Goldsmiths Islamic Society was the head of um, cage prisoners, Moaz and Beg. Uh, but what, their, what Gita said uh, just the other day was that, you know, she went and spoke at Goldsmiths and there was no problem. Why was it a problem for me? Because I am an apostate in their mm -hmm. eyes. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that's a story that still people are not really touching, you know, because it is still the no-go area. You know, right. they can talk about homophobia because that is an acceptable form of bigotry, and rightly so. But mm -hmm. the phobia, the hatred, the incitement to hatred, and the incitement to violence against apostates is the story that is still not really being reported anywhere. Absolutely. And I mean, just in their statement, when they the Islamic society wrote <clears throat> and said that, you know, just a few of her of her Islamophobic statements, just a few examples of her Islamophobic statements, she labeled the niqab, a religious symbol for Muslim women, a flag for far right Islamism. And she went on to tweet that they are body bags for women. So these are examples of how awful you supposedly are. Right. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what's interesting is that I, I have every article and every statement I've ever ha made on my website. And even out of context, you know how every time you talk to them, they say, oh, it's been taken out of context. Mm -hmm. Well, even out of context, they cannot find a word I've said or a thing that I've done that's bigoted. You know, mm -hmm. even the examples that they're giving are criticisms of uh, what I think are tools for the suppression of women. You know, I mean, as an ex-Muslim uh, woman, how is it that you are expected to tolerate a tool that is used time and time again to control women, to control their sexuality, like the niqab, that is not, uh, you know, something moderate Muslims endorse usually? So I don't understand how people think that niqab opposition coming from a woman of that background is bigotry. She's opposing her own oppression. You know, yeah, but like, I think that that's what what's happened, isn't it? It's that's the whole, um, you know, the twilight zone place that we're in. That it's become such that even when you criticize, you know, something that you were, you know, I had to wear the veil, for example, in Iran. The veil is compulsory in Iran. Uh, still, we're not allowed to criticize it because everything comes is seen through Islamist eyes. And what's interesting is they're using the language of tolerance, safe mm -hmm. space, yep. uh, incitement to Literally hatred, this and that. Like, yeah, exactly, to okay. actually promote their own intolerance, you know, mm -hmm. against women, against homosexuals and gay people, against free thinkers and dissenters. And of course, when you look at the niqab, 
there are so many Muslims who are opposed to it. Absolutely. Even the veil is so contested across the Middle East, North Africa, South Asia. So many you countries know, that it's banned ridiculous. it. Muslim countries have banned it in the workplace and, you know, different situations dry, while driving. I don't understand, you know, why um, any challenge to it in the West is seen as bigoted when clearly even Muslim countries are, you know, sometimes opposed to it. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, definitely, yeah, definitely. And I think that's where, for me, you know, I feel a betrayal, really, because uh, I know the Islamists are fascists. For me, I don't expect mm -hmm. anything for them. I don't expect better from them, you know. Mm -hmm. But when a feminist society and an LGBTQ plus society, yeah. they side with them, then I say, look, this is a politics of betrayal, and I demand an apology from them. You know, Definitely. what got me angry was their siding with the Islamic society, not what the Islamic society did. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. and I think what they have done is obviously Islamists are to blame for what they do, but what many of these people who consider themselves left and progressives and liberals have done is given the language and the justification and the legitimization for Islamists to wreak havoc across the globe as well as you know in in many cities across europe you know we cannot say fundamental things that it, it's just you know it, it's funny that i'm the one who's called controversial i'm mm -hmm. the one who seemed to be mm -hmm. inflammatory well i'm not calling for anyone's death i'm not calling for anyone to <laughs> be hurt or discriminated yeah. against i'm actually saying everyone has a right to religion they also have a right to be free from religion if mm -hmm. anything it's not, it shouldn't be controversial. And the fact that it is just shows how much the Islamist narrative has taken hold amongst those who are supposed to be on our side. Mm -hmm. yep. And I mean, like on a, uh, on a normal day, you'll see feminists fighting against slut shaming and stuff like that, that, you know, what women wear doesn't define, uh, you know, uh, what they are or what they do. It should not depend on, you know, men's lust you know, to what they're wearing, men are responsible for keeping their own lust in check and women are not responsible for that, right? So they'll fight for that on like a Western plane, but they, when we fight for that and say that we are not responsible for men keeping their lust in check, it is not us that should be covered. We are deemed bigots. It's no, And also we're told that the veil is a tool for liberation. Right. <laughs> like saying the chastity belt or... <laughs> foot binding or sati you know throwing a woman on a burning fire right. yeah. these it's are so liberation anti-imperialist expression yeah. female rebellion yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. moving on a little from that uh, we were talking a bit about islamism and how it's uh, a far-right movement within islam and the the western left can't seem to see that but a bit about the far right in the West, um, I find that a lot of people can't, a lot of legitimate critics of Islam can't seem to distinguish between far right criticism of Islam and Muslims, which lumps all people in together, and then legitimate criticism of the ideology and bad ideas. And um, I'm finding that I'm seeing an increase in far-right supporters, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, even in like the online atheist scene. Are you are you finding that recently? Yeah, yeah. I think it's very worrying. I think um, you know. I, I think uh, before I say that, though, I want to say that I think any criticism is legitimate in the sense that people have a right to express their oh, their, course, their yeah. feelings and beliefs. Uh, I do think, though, uh, you know, I also don't even feel like hate speech should be limited because um, I think a lot of religion, for example, is hate speech yeah. against apostates and women and so on and so forth. And and I think hate speech can be quite subjective. I mean, a lot of people will say what I say is hate speech, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think, obviously, that incitement to violence is a very different thing. And that's where we should be looking at Islamic societies and the far right in, in what they do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if, if people don't see the difference between, let's say, our criticism of Islam and Islamism um, uh, and you know, the far right's criticism, I think it's because they might have an affinity with the far right, to be quite honest. 
Um, yeah. You know, and I, I think I, I do know. I, I do notice that, um, uh, uh, especially if someone says, oh, there's no left, there's no right, you know, there's no far right, we're all in it together. Well, mm-hmm. well, hold on, no, I'm sorry, no, we're not. Yeah. Because for me, I think if I'm anti-Islam, uh, as I'm anti any religion, or anti-Islamism, as I am anti all religious right mm-hmm. movements, whether it's the Buddhist right or, mm-hmm. you know, the Hindu right, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. the Christian right, and so on, the Jewish right, uh, it's because I want to defend uh, citizenship rights, universal rights, and you know equality. For example, um, it's not because I want to defend my religion or my Western civilization vis-a-vis the savages. You know the right, other. Right. Right. Um, and and what's interesting is though the left that we don't agree with, the regressive left, as some would call it, because mm-hmm. I'm very much firmly on the left myself, mm-hmm. and the far right, though they seem to think that they disagree, they're actually using the same analysis of the situation. They're both seeing the Muslim community as homogeneous. Mm-hmm. So with this regressive left sees it as homogeneous, and therefore they side with the Islamists. The far right see it as homogeneous, and therefore think all Muslims are the same as Islamists. Mm-hmm. So they want all Muslims mm-hmm. out. They want the Quran banned. Both mm-hmm. of them cannot see dissent. Both of them cannot see, you know, the, the many who are resisting in various ways, in many with, with great risk to their lives as well. And mm-hmm. so, and both of them are using identity politics. You know, even the the so called the far right is using identity politics, even though it keeps criticizing it, to promote its own white identity politics. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and so that's why I think identity politics. We just need to get rid of it. We need to go back to the basics of universal rights. You know, people being citizens, irrespective of their beliefs and backgrounds, and of course, secularism. You know an unequivocal defense of secularism. And I've seen uh, people that are your critics uh, kind of describe you as this um, person who will not, uh, you know, see any criticism of, you know, mass migration or uh, mass immigration as legitimate, or you just want complete open borders and no vetting. And I'm sure that's, that's not true. Right. I'm sure you see yeah. that there, there is some uh, legitimate concerns to be brought up, perhaps not blanket condemnation. But what are yeah. your thoughts? I mean, yeah, the thing about with uh, mass migration, yeah, I, I'm for open borders and I think refugees have a right to asylum. Uh, you know, I think if you look at the movement, that movement, mass movements that were seen across the globe, a large majority are coming from Islamist countries uh, or countries with Islamic laws or where there is, you know, war and chaos, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. Look at these statistics in every country who are the majorities. And it is very much, um, you know, a large portion of these migrants and refugees are coming from from there. So. Uh, from my perspective, you know, it's not enough just to support the atheist um, uh, mm-hmm. migrants who are coming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when you live in a society under Sharia law, everyone is at risk. Everyone can be a target for various reasons. Your hair is too long. You're wearing jeans. Mm-hmm. You went to a party and you're dancing. You're in love with someone you're not supposed to be in love with. You laughed out too loud. You sang. You tried to go into a football game. Yeah. where there's gender segregation. I mean, everything is a criminal offense. Yeah. You know, they are against 21st century life. And so there are ordinary people, not necessarily political, not necessarily atheists, might might be Muslim, might not, who are constantly being pushed back and suppressed um, by Islamism. So my point is that there's you know, the people who are fleeing have a legitimate reason for fleeing. A vast majority do. And also that, you know, this is a democratic way of saying no. They are, you know, the only way people have in the face very often of guns and bombs and decapitations and Sharia courts, you know, kangaroo courts, is to vote with their very feet and to leave. You know, and we know that leaving is not an easy thing. If anyone who's listening has left, mm-hmm. um, it, it's hard. You leave everything behind. You leave everyone behind. You know, uh, one uh, a reporter asked me for video footage from when I was young. Well, boy, I don't have it. I don't have it. We left everything behind. You leave and you go and you treat yeah. it like crap and you're stopped at borders and you, you don't know when you're going to be able to find a place where you can 
manage to set roots and feel like you belong. You know, it's yeah. not an easy thing to do. Plus, with the closed borders, it is an impossibility for many people to, to leave. They're literally dying trying to get out. Mm -hmm. So my point is that it's a right, you know, there's the 1951 Convention for Refugees, the 1967 Protocol. Asylum is a human right, just like the right to life is a human right, just like the right to food is a human right. My point is that you cannot decide who gets rights based mm -hmm. on whether you like them or not, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, it's as simple as that. You don't like someone, you can't deny them access to a hospital, you can't deny them access to um, you know, uh, child welfare um, provisions, just because you don't like this child, he, he's too naughty. Mm -hmm. What what I want to say is that you, you shouldn't be uh, making restrictions and conditions upon a right, yeah? Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, though, when people come, we're all fingerprinted, our identities are verified, we're asked a, a million and two thousand questions, you know, to be able to even... Uh, get any sort of identification. We know there are lots of checks and lots of questions and um, information that's required and goes back and forth. Sometimes the process takes very long. So obviously, you know, that is part and parcel of, of things. But what I want to say is that when you start saying that I only want those refugees who are the good Muslims, the ones that I like, you know. How can you even... I, Figure that out, first of all. Exactly. Exactly. It's subjective. And second of all, you know, you can't place your restrictions on people based on what you think. Um, and, and that's where I say that it, this is where the far right narrative is coming into the picture. You're mm -hmm. not necessarily far right if you say this. Mm -hmm. uh, you're concerned about immigration. It's not necessarily racism. Mm -hmm. But when it's brought in uh, to, in, you know, in, in the debate, to decide on the fate of those who are most vulnerable, there is a racism, underlying racism there, you know. Um, and for me, I think, you know, it, I, I can't bear to see children drowning in the sea, as I'm sure a majority of people can't bear it, which is why we've seen so much outpouring of support of refugees and asylum seekers, despite the constant propaganda against them in the media and by, by governments. Yeah. Because there is this human connection when you see people just trying to, to survive. But again, that's not saying every refugee is good, in mm -hmm. the same way that not everyone who's white and British is wonderful. Uh, there are people who are fascists. There are people who might, you know, uh, lie about their age. There are people who uh, might take advantage and take, um, you know, two sandwiches when they're supposed to take one and on and on. But you can't determine what rights people have access to based on an inquisition. And I think that's what a lot of I see atheists calling for. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I say is, look, if you're only compassionate to your in-group, well, that's not compassion. Mm -hmm. It's not right. compassion. If you want to show compassion, it has to be to people who are not necessarily like you, but that you, you are able to see the humanity in them. And I think the problem with identity politics is it has taken the human being out of the equation. Yep. And that's why it's possible for such inhuman measures and policies to be seen as perfectly legitimate, you know, um, things to support and defend, whereas actually they are indefensible, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, uh, I, I agree with you on, on uh, almost, well, a lot of that stuff, because uh, as an immigrant myself, my dad was a, a refugee from the partition of India. Like, I mean, I can only imagine how rough it must be to flee a war-torn country. Um, and... But what I wanted to ask about was what you've explained is, you know, certain nuances in your position that people may not uh, be aware of. Like you said, the checks and the fingerprinting and the vetting, these are all things uh, you're open to. I mean, people try to paint you as someone who just wants, um, I don't know, like chaos because <laughs> you just want to accept all the Islamists and everyone. I feel like, uh, you're not well, an you know, person. That, that's yeah, but that's that's I think a, a lie perpetrated by people who uh, want to stop immigrants and migration, yeah, right. and yeah. you know, and I think that's fine because this is a fight of ideas. There will be people who will misrepresent positions and so on and so forth. But you know, it's sort of like saying that the demand for free healthcare is inviting chaos. 
No, it's mm. not inviting chaos. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they'll say that, oh, they'll take advantage of it and people will shop around for this and that. Look, it's a basic human right. If we start from the same assumptions, then we can reach similar conclusions. But if we don't start from the assumption that healthcare, that food, that safety and refuge from war and, and you know, bombings and Islamism and Sharia courts are basic human rights. If we start with that assumption, then I think it becomes very clear that people should be given refuge and protection. You know, we are a very small global village now. You know, we our lives are so interconnected. You have Islamists hacking Bangladeshi bloggers to death in Bangladesh. You have Islamists putting Bangladeshi bloggers in the UK on a death list. Our yeah. lives are intertwined. There's no escaping it. Islamism is a global movement. You have British-born white jihadis going and fighting for ISIS. And you have people, secularists, fleeing from Syria. You know, it's a very small world. And we have a responsibility to uh, people across the world, you know, beyond borders, beyond but our, our limited in-groups. Opposed to, say, if someone is a proven terrorist or, you know, dangerous, you're not opposed to kind of uh, not letting them in because they have a criminal record or something. Well, I mean, for me, I think that, you know, if, if anyone's concerned about the Islamists and terrorists, it's people like myself to begin mm -hmm. with because we are most at risk. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, everyone should be treated in the same way. If you have a British terrorist, they're not sent off somewhere else. You know, right. try them, try them, imprison them. What I worry about is you find a terrorist, you send them back to Syria so they'll kill more people there or to Iran. Try them, try them in an international court, put them in jail, prosecute them. You know, it's all of our responsibilities. When you look at, you know, the sort of support that Islamist groups are getting, including from Western governments, you know, uh, the funding, um, you know, the relations with the Saudi regime, if we find anyone who's a terrorist, anyone who's committed a crime against humanity, they must be tried and prosecuted. Don't start deporting them somewhere where they have free reign to kill like and murder. That. No, I meant like um, the refugees coming in. If someone is a known terrorist and they're not from your country, why would you why would you accept them and try them? Well, no, don't don't accept them, but try, that, try but them. I yeah, yeah. Because right. if they're a terrorist, if they're a terrorist, they've committed crimes against humanity, and it is the responsibility of any state to try criminals uh, who uh, those who have uh, committed crimes against humanity. My yeah. point is that you know take some responsibility also in prosecuting those who have committed these crimes. Mm -hmm. You, if you send them back to Syria, well, how many more people will they kill? My point is that yeah, we should prosecute people who've committed crimes, but, you know, I have a problem with pre presuming that those who are fleeing are either all ISIS, they're all Islamists, they're all, you know, horrible, yeah, it's the generalization right. and not recognizing yeah. that, uh, yeah. you know, future uh, ex-Muslims, liberal Muslims fleeing from ISIS, they're all included in that large Yeah, and also it could be conservative Muslims who, who would never be. heard a fly. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got Member, family members who are very conservative, but really lovely, decent people, you know. Yeah, yeah. So my point is treat people as individuals, not as a collective. And this yeah, is what, I can this is my that. point. Holy. Do yeah. not place collective blame. And don't also give collective uh, a green card, you know. The Muslim community can do no wrong, according to the lefts and liberals. So even the Islamists get a green card to do what they want. Yeah. No, treat people and groups and movements, treat people as individuals, recognize groups and movements that are causing havoc and deal with them politically. And if anyone has committed a crime, you treat them as a criminal. But, you know, just because you have a doctor, for example, Shipman, who murdered his patients, you don't place collective blame on all doctors. Yeah. But don't do that with migrants either. My yeah. point is when you place collective sort of judgments on people, there is bigotry behind that because you cannot yeah. see the humanity of people. Right. And that's what we need to move away from. Yeah, the generalizations just don't fly with me either. Um, but speaking of this topic, I saw you um, get into an interesting discussion with uh, Sam Harris on Twitter. Um, do you have anything, any comments you can you can talk about? or? Yeah, well, well uh, to be... 
to be fair, I mean, I haven't read much of Sam Harris's work, but the things that I have, I have seen, one was where he supported the prof profiling of Muslims and the other where he did say, yes, we should, you know, support Muslims, the secular, the liberal, the ones that are just like us. Mm -hmm. Those things really, uh, you know, I don't agree with. And for the very reasons that we spoke about just mm -hmm. previous to this. So for me, I think it, it does place collective blame. He says he doesn't, um, but I think it does, you know, and I think it's, it's sort of like, yes, we can show compassion, but only to those who look like us, who sound like us, who are like us. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not real compassion. And also that's not recognizing that whether you like people or not, they have rights. They have fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. Whether you like religion or not, as we know, people have a right to religion. And whether you like it or not, people have a right to be free from persecution and to be able to live in in some sort of safety, you know, even if they're, oh, you know, Muslims or, you know, mm -hmm. um, even if they fled from what very often people think are, oh, those, you know, um, Muslim territories where they're all barbarians and savages, mm -hmm. you know, whereas, of course, we know that's not the case. There's so much dissent and resistance in countries that are ruled by Sharia law or Islamic states, you know, in fact, I think that there's so much resistance. That's why the Islamists need such violence, you know, such indiscriminate, brute violence. If everyone agreed with them, why would they need to be decapitating people and throwing them off buildings and segregating women and putting them in, in you know, mobile body bags? There is this sort of resistance and dissent, particularly since there's so many young people in uh, like in Iran, for example, seventy percent are under thirty. Well, of course, it's just logical that there's going to be huge amounts of resistance and dissent. So, for me, I, I feel you know very uncomfortable with this sort of um, line. But I also feel very uncomfortable with the sort of perspective that seems to say that we're not allowed to criticize you know the leaders, whoever they may be. Yeah, and I, I think that's very dangerous. You know, we should be able to criticize. And we would be able to challenge um, and debate things and not give people a green card. I, I will not give my allegiance to anyone forever, mm -hmm. uh, including those that I work with, because I've been in politics for too long now to know that mm -hmm. there are people who your friends yesterday who will no longer be depending on what road they take, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that even if people are not your enemies, they may not necessarily be your allies. For me, the fight against Islamism and against, uh, you know, I, Islam is one that has to be coupled fundamentally and unequivocally with anti-racism and a defense of citizens, including Muslims. You know, if it's not, uh, I don't see that person as my ally in this fight. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, Sam and you both, I'm, I'm a fan of both of you, and uh, I, I'm not sure that I agree with that assessment because I feel that he does um, make an effort to distinguish between people and ideas and not generalize. I know the profiling thing you're talking about, and I think that was just a very bad choice of phrasing. Uh, he's explained it time and time again that you know he didn't really mean uh, racial profiling, but he meant um, to kind of stop wasting time on profiling or on this sense of equality where we're profiling grandmas the same as certain uh, types of people who are more likely to be. Well, exactly, certain types of people, and that's the profiling. Yeah, so I, I don't know how you can but he explain it to me. in that as well. And I understand, I mean, there are, <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree with him I'm entirely. Sorry. That. And that sounds a bit too funny for me, but oh, okay, I mean... I think just the use of the term profiling, we're not, I mean, we're not, you know, we, we know what that term means, especially in the U.S. We know very well what profiling means and the racism behind profiling in policing. I mean, I used to live in, in New York City. I've been beaten up by New York City police cops uh -huh. in the uh, in the demonstration against the first Gulf War. I was uh, charged with 13 years imprisonment if uh they were successful. They basically said that us, we attacked the police. And thank goodness, one journalist had a video of them beating the hell out of us. 
Um, so and I, I went through years in the court system trying to uh, get justice for that, and finally um, I did. But my point is that we know very well, especially in the context of the U.S., the racism behind profiling. And to say, to use that word, mm-hmm. um, and to say that I didn't really mean that, uh, I'm sorry, sounds a little dishonest to me. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to cause problems. Uh, and I don't want to add to my, um, you know, to the fights I have. I have too many people to fight. No, I, really, I really completely <laughs> get that. I, there's so many di- different sides always attacking you. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I can't speak for Sam, so I can't really explain it any further. And you're not offending me at all, because I think it's important even to challenge people that we admire and not uh, have this dogmatic uh, faith in in anyone, really. So I do admire that you will take on big names, even though you know that that will end up in a backlash at you. Because I have seen how kind of blindly people will accept things that certain people will say, regardless of what they are, there'll be no free thought involved or critical thought involved. Which is quite interesting, interesting, isn't it, actually? There are people, however, that um, sometimes get uh, grouped in with Sam Harris, uh, possibly because he invites them on his podcast, like... (laughs) Douglas Murray. For, for me, I, I spend as much time fighting the far right and making sure that they're not able to use what I say right. uh, as I do fighting Islamism. And I think for me, that's what what, what I mean when I say it's key in, in the West in particular. In Iran, you're against the Iranian regime. You don't need to worry about racism. But when you do live in, you know... I mean, obviously, there's racism in Iran. I don't mean it that way. There's huge amounts of racism against Afghans, even fascism against them, against uh, uh, minorities like uh, Turkish-speaking Iranians and so on and so forth. But what I mean is, you know, a criticism of Islam and the Islamic State is not meshed with racism. So you can just be against the Iranian regime. Here... You do need to have an anti-racist component to your to Definitely. your because uh, it gets your high struggle. All the time, right? Like racists and bigots uh, enjoy criticism of Islam for their own reasons. Um, <coughs> it's happened to what my work. I mean, they've taken something I've written and published it on Jihad Watch without my yeah. consent, and that's right. not the place that I'm coming from at all. So I do yeah. find it very important that I challenge. Uh, any instance of anti-Muslim bigotry that I come across so that I separate myself from them and so that they are forced to unhitch their wagons from me and my critique because we are not the same at all. Um, yeah. But yeah, th- and so, so who you, uh, who you um, interview, who you ally with, who yeah. you accept invitations for, all of these things are part of that fight. And I think it, it's, you know, if you, it's not enough to give lip service to something because there are people on the far right, Tommy Robinson. I actually interviewed Tommy Robinson, but um, in a, in a way where I challenged his views, it wasn't, I'm, you know, so honored and so impressed by your views. It was like, well, Tommy, we agree on our criticism of Islam, but how can you be generalizing people? You're being counter counterproductive to the cause itself. If you care about the cause, you should have productive conversation and not... Yeah, uh, but it's... it's um, the, the point is, though, that they will also say that they're not being anti-Muslim. A lot of the far right will say that. And obviously, you know, you need to judge political movements in particular by not only what they say uh, and also people, but also what they do and where they stand on key issues. And so I think that that for me is is quite crucial to ally with people also because I, I'm working with a lot of Muslim groups as well. And, you know, I, I find that in this fight, I have many Muslims um, that work with me and there are some atheists that I prefer not to work with because of these, these things. And it's not just that it's counterproductive. But racism is dehumanizing it's inhuman yep. uh it is it, it kills it's um you know um denies people dignity and it's a very you know it's 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 not just that tommy robinson if he stops generalizing he can manage to be productive it's because he comes from 
uh, an idea and a movement that is very similar fundamentally to the Islamist movement. Yeah. They do place collective blame. They are misogynist. They are homophobic. They are defending their religion vis-a-vis a foreign religion. They use religion very often. Yeah. You know, so in all of those instances, I think we can never have a productive Tommy Robinson. You know, unless of course he's an, he becomes an ex-fascist. Right, which uh, I just thought. Like, so that's why I extended. Ah, yeah. uh, uh, you know, right. Yeah. Patient. Like I thought when he left um, the EDL, it was I had I had hope and I wanted oh, yeah. to chat with him and try to show him that uh, you know there's all kinds of Muslims and ex-Muslims and perhaps you know it would have some impact, but uh, clearly it, it it didn't. But it was an interesting conversation. Yeah, I mean, what 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 I said when uh, he left was that you know we have to see because it's not enough to say that you've left. One, you have to also uh, make a break with your past. You know, like uh, Majid Nawaz is not just an ex. He doesn't just say he's an ex-Islamist. He makes a break with Islamism. Yeah. very clearly he criticizes it so that you can take him. Yeah. Uh, f- you know, it's not just that you have to believe his word. You can see what he's doing and how he's made that break in his criticisms, in his defenses. With Tommy Robinson, he was still defending the EDL lads. And of course, now he's uh, with Pegida. And very mm-hmm. clearly, he says that, you know, I, I didn't think it was the right time then. But now with Pegida, I see that this is the right time for Europe. So the only reason he left was because he thought he would have more access uh, in another uh, sort of um, reinvention, which was not really a reinvention anyway. So I think, yeah, these things are important, you know, in the sense of um, making making very clear that, you know, these are different movements, not just because they generalize, but because they're also very inhuman in, their, in, in what they do and say. Right, but, I mean, I feel like... Um... It's it's okay. To, it's it's good to have conversations with people uh, who you oppose so greatly, but as long as you challenge them rather than side with sure. them. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Sure. Sure. No. No. I don't mean you shouldn't have had the conversation with. Yeah. I, I mean, as an alliance. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I'm actually yeah. answering. Um, you, I do have people saying, "Well, you should be working with the EDL. You should be working with Stop Islamization of America and Europe." And uh, because you're saying the same thing, and I want to say, no, we're not saying the same thing. You know, the no, Iranian no. regime is anti-U.S. militarism, and so am I. That doesn't mean I'm saying the same thing as the Iranian regime. Yeah, yeah. It's it, nice you know, and it, it's it's very different because it's why you say it, how you say it, it's for what ends you say it. You know, if you say you're anti-Islam because you want to get rid of all Muslims and immigrants, well, that's definitely a very different aim than than what what my aim is. And so, right. and I think when, these things are important. When people pair up you and Douglas Murray, it makes me laugh because they're like, "Oh, my two favorite commentators on Islam." <laughs> that's an amazing comparison because they are literally on night and day. <laughs> yeah, people just see, you know, oh, criticism of Islam. We're all in the same boat, but yeah. we're not. Yeah. There are exactly. many shades, angles, degrees, and I think it's important that we make these distinctions as well so that we can move ahead with the conversation rather than be de- delegitimized by being all tarred as bigots. You know? Yeah, and also, I think it, you know, some will say that it weakens our movement by separating it but i think it actually strengthens it because it attacks the concept of identity politics as well that we side with people based on politics and ideals not based on identity and also you know that this is beyond identity you know there are people who uh, are in the east who are defending these ideals and people in the west who are opposing them it's it's it goes across borders and boundaries and it's working together in solidarity over ideals and politics rather than you know identity politics which is so regressive yeah i mean i think it, you know it's fine to have disagreements amongst atheists uh, you know i think uh, there's sometimes people feel that we shouldn't be uh, criticizing each other i think we yeah. saw that with that sam harris thing yeah i yeah. also was taken aback by how strong the feeling was when I criticized Adam Dean's being hired at Quillian Foundation. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think it's it's 
it, it, it is then you can kind of see how people in the so-called Muslim community feel because, you know, they're being told, don't criticize, don't speak up because it will then make open us all up. Bad or... Exactly. Make us all yeah. look bad or just make it easier for people to, do, to criticize. And I think that should be a very natural part of especially people who consider themselves free thinkers, skeptics, atheists. It shouldn't be so difficult. And I did, I'm taken aback by how strongly people feel um, that criticism shouldn't be allowed because, you know, Majid is under attack because Sam is on our side and, he, you know, you shouldn't be criticizing him and so on and so forth. And I think, in fact, that's it's very healthy to be able to criticize um, and to be able to challenge. And we need to do that. Uh, and it's important to remember that, you know, I at least have never signed my name in blood anywhere, not in my political party, not in my beliefs. Mm -hmm. They are changing constantly. Mm -hmm. I'm revising them. I'm making new allies every day um, mm -hmm. and uh, turning my back on old ones. You know, I've worked with people who are now on the far right, uh, people who yeah. are, um, you know, unfortunately, that's that's how things go. People who uh, have changed a million ways, as have I most probably. And so yeah. I think it, it's important to see the struggle rather than identities and who we're allowed to criticize and not and limits placed on it. Right. right. And to not stagnate with our ideas. Right. And to keep that's why it's important to keep rethinking and challenging and reassessing where we're going there's such a fine line between the apologist camp and the bigot camp and in between there's a rational discussion but it's so minor because the extremes are shouting louder and they're the ones dominating the conversation so yeah definitely yeah for me it's not just about having a conversation mm -hmm. but it's about mobilizing support to change um the the situation to change the status quo to push back islamism the religious right and to uh, push forward a more secular a more equal society you know so i think um that's why it is important to be very clear what we're fighting for where we're headed because i think um you know i think a, a perspective that is both anti-islamist anti-religious ideas uh, or ideas that are unfair or discriminatory uh, but a defense of people and humanity is is a, a sort of position that a majority of people can get behind. And that's why it's, I think it's really important to be very clear in drawing the line against any sort of collective blame or bigotry because it is uh, what will help make this the mass movement that it, at, that it is. But unfortunately, I think it's still, you know, not as visible as it needs to be. And we all need to work towards making it visible, making it stronger, and hopefully bringing it to some sort of success. I think this is a great uh, place to wrap up. And if there's anything else you wanted to add or say. Or promote. Or promote. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, I think uh, one of our issues, of course, is funding. We have very, very little funding. And I think, you know, we do have this problem across the board where we have religious organizations are so well funded and oh, yeah. we're not. Uh, we're not. And so I think, you know, if um, atheists and secularists do support groups like the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, One Law for All, uh, the Bread and Roses TV, which is a TV program that's broadcast in Iran via illegal satellite dishes. The Iranian regime has called it immoral and corrupt. And it promotes... If that is a good reason, support. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <know> so, <laughs> exactly. You know, so it's sort of like, you know, that sort of support really, we, we need to see a lot more of it because... Um, a lot of the barriers we face is, of course, financial. And the other thing is mm -hmm. because it's not just the threats and intimidations we get, but it's everything, you know, we do is an uphill battle. If we want to have an event, you, we were going to have an art exhibition against hate, you know, both hate against Muslims as well as hate against ex-Muslims, and the gallery pulled out because they're too afraid. You know, we had an anniversary event in June. We wanted to have our NGO drinks there. They said, no, we don't want to come because we don't want trouble. We want to have a big conference in 2017. We went to the place where we had our conference in 2014. They said, no, we don't want you because we had threats when you were here. Yeah. So, 
you know, it's a, an uphill battle even to hold a meeting. For us, nothing is simple. Yeah. Not holding a meeting, not, um, you know, um, um, meeting with people. You never know what, what's in line for you when you do meet people. You know, so that support is really key. And I think that there could be a lot more support. Uh, and that means both financial, but also, you know, in kind, we need loads of volunteers and loads of help in various things. So if people want to help in any way, we'd love to have them get in touch with us. Awesome. And how can they get in touch with you? Well, they can go on any of our websites, which is the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, which is ex ex muslim dot org dot uk one law for all dot org dot uk or i've got my own site which is marinamazi dot com and they can get contact details on any of those Perfect. and get in touch Perfect. all right well i hope that many people will and um best of luck to you thank you so so much for taking the time thank you Miriam. to speak thank with you us. i think it and was thank you for having me as well such an important conversation so uh yeah, yeah keep doing what you're doing keep being awesome keep challenging the far right which not enough people do and uh i'll see you on twitter <laughs> and you too you too thank you thank you Miriam. Yeah. you've been listening to polite conversations with ina and paul Thank you for downloading and listening to us. If you'd like to hear more of the show's content, head over to YouTube and find us by searching for Polite Conversations Podcast. You can find the wonderful host, Ina, on Twitter at Nice Mangoes. No E in mangoes now. And you can find me, her illustrious co-host, Paul Sading, on Twitter as well, at The Q Podcast or at AAP Podcast Show. You can also reach me on Facebook by heading over to facebook.com forward slash the Q Podcast or facebook.com forward slash Atheist Apocalypse. And last but not least, we would like to thank you for being part of the conversation. If there's something you would like to see discussed or you would like to be part of the conversation, you can contact us at verypoliteconversations at gmail.com. And we look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. Well, not all of you. You know what we're saying. This is supposed to be polite and all.